We are recording. Thank you so much for joining us, audience. Thank you, Danny, you're at the bottom of my screen. Eve, you're at the top left of my screen. Um, it's an absolute honor to have this rather wonderful at least a treat. Um, and um, it is being recorded. It will be posted on our YouTube channel. So um, all I'm gonna do is give you a quick, uh, quick intro and then I'm gonna disappear. I'm gonna be asking all the audience to be sending questions in to me and I will put those to Danny in about 20 minutes time. Okay, so along the bottom of the screen, you will see a Q&A function. I want that to be filled with all your weird and wonderful questions uh, about Danny, about Danny's books and about anything else you can think of that might spring to mind. So uh, without further ado, can I hand over to Danny and Danny's publicist, Eve. Well, thank hey. you. Hello, <laughs> hello, hello, everybody. How are you? I hope you're very, very well indeed. And um, thanks to Ben. And he'll be back if you've got questions. I've got answers. That's my, <laughs> that's kind of my slogan. And I'm uh, Eve Vesotsi Morris, uh, and I am a publicist at Simon Schuster Children's Books, which means I organise press interviews, organise events like this one, uh, and I'm very fortunate uh, to have been working with Danny for the last couple of years. So I'm going to ask some of my questions, because uh, as well as working in book publicity, I'm also a very big book nerd. So I've got lots of questions for Danny. Uh, which he is going to answer and then yeah we'll, we'll hand over to your questions which Ben will answer uh, which we'll put to Danny so um, we are here because of the day the screens went blank which yes. is your first book uh, not your first book <laughs> you've had lots of books you've had so many books yeah. but it's uh, the first one this year uh, that has come out and well, that's true it's illustrated by Gemma Coral as well. Um, so it's got lots of lovely illustrations in it. And it came out on the 18th of March. Um, so what does it feel like to have your book come out into the world? You've been working on it secretly and now it's out, it's out and about. It's lovely. It's strange when you write a book because um, it's on your computer and that's the only place it is. And no one knows anything really about it, only you. And you have to, at some point, you've got to think, well, this is finished now. It's usually when you get to the end. And what you then do is you unleash it unto the world and you press send and suddenly you have no control over it anymore. Because I could have tinkered and tinkered and tinkered. I could still be tinkering. You know, I'm good at tinkering. I would have just tinkered and tinkered and tinkered for the rest of my life. But you have to, at some point, press send and then it's out of your control. And whatever you've written, that's what people are going to read and it's quite nice it's quite you feel quite free afterwards and then you see it in the shops and you might see a kid going up and ignoring it or <laughs> or picking it up and then you're willing them you're going oh, come on choose this one come on and um, sometimes they do and it's very exciting it sounds like I hang around in bookshops staring at customers I don't do that it's just if I happen to be there I'll have a little a little glance and um and sometimes it's great when when uh, when someone picks it up and, and wants to take it home. I'm just picturing you like peering over the shelves at a, at a small child as they peruse the children's section and and then saying, I think that one's good in a, yes. a non-creepy way. It, yeah, um, well, I would hope I would hope not. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's great, though, because um, I always like big what if questions. And I, I have done since I was a kid and and writing these books um, I sort of go back to uh, being a kid and and remembering the ideas that would excite me so you know it could be anything and I always think this is a great exercise for a kid if you're a kid and you want to be a writer start with a what if you know what if I decided to copy my cat all day you know and then suddenly all of your decisions are being made by a cat um, I mean it wouldn't be great you would end up uh, I suppose at the end of the day, just on the floor of the kitchen eating cat food. So, you know, I'm not doing that. Um, not, not again, anyway. And I thought about, you know, what if the whole world just got stuck still and you were the only person that could move around and all the grown ups were like that and you could tie your teacher's shoelaces together and then when the world started again, they'd fall over and they wouldn't know you were to blame. Or you could go to the sweet shop and just, you know, have all the sweets or you could go to the theme park and just ride all the rides or get in a Lamborghini and drive that around all these kind of big what ifs and so it was really um yeah it was it was before lockdown that I thought what if all the screens went blank and then lockdown happened 
And we all started to rely a lot more on screens than, than we had before, whether for school or for pressing a button and summoning up your grandma um, or talking to your pals or just playing games or watching films. What if all that went away? So no iPads, no iPhones, no Kindle, no TV, no, and you know, then it get weirder and no cash machines, no being able to pay for anything. Um, we rely so much on these things that I thought a big what if might be, what if we took them all away? But then lockdown did happen. And I remember I was writing this and the world outside my window was getting weirder than the world in my book. So I had to kind of allow the past year to seep in this book, which was good fun. Good. So the book is all about that horrific occurrence. It's, yeah, it's a horror movie in the waiting. Um, well, when all the thought, screens, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, the, 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 the title, The Day the Screens Went Blank, it just sounded like a kind of a comedy horror for kids. But then I was also thinking, this would be quite a comedy horror for grown ups because, you know, some of the kids, they'll be, you know, sitting with their, parents right now and they know that their parents are just as reliant on the screen as they are probably more so but the parent gets to do it because oh no their screen's more important just because they've been on the planet a little longer no very important for kids as well particularly during lockdown so it was it was also a way of talking like to having starting a conversation between you know you the kid and your grown-up about like what's what their life was like at your age because I think my kids think that I grew up incredibly deprived because I couldn't just press a button and start watching a film I used to have to get up walk into town go to some weird shop walk up to the person and ask if I could borrow a film and and already that's weird but if they didn't have that film or if someone in my town already was watching that film I wasn't allowed to watch the film and it seems now, I mean, I sound like I'm 132 years old, um, but that's what it was. You'd go to the video shop and um, and it was a way of, of, of getting the family in my in my book to start talking about their own childhoods and, and sort of what's what's most fun and what matters as well. And I think that you're going to read a little bit from the beginning of the book. Well, I'm going to make you read from the beginning of the book because I want to hear it. Um, which sort of sets up the whole sort of the story, the beginning of the story. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it stars a girl called Stella, who I loved writing. And you know, um, you know, when you are getting towards the end of reading a book and you think, I'm going to miss this character, and you slow down a little bit and you can feel the book ending. Um, I was like that when I was writing Stella. I, I felt like I'm going to miss her. And I kind of slowed down when I was writing the end. So, yeah. So she is a very nice girl. She's um, super organized. Um, she's very sensible. She has um, a fun little family and they always have a tradition that they do, but we start to see that maybe the tradition could be improved. This is the cover, by the way, look, shiny. Mm. I like shiny things, don't you everybody? Huh? Shiny. <laughs> so, it's special hollow yes. foil actually used on the cover. Very Hollow foil. Um, right, so I'll, I'll just uh, read a few minutes of this. Chapter one. So Sundays in my house are awesome because on Sundays we have Bobcroft Family Film Night and Bobcroft Family Film Night is spectacular because dad dims the lights and mum makes popcorn. So already this is kind of a winner, right? The whole of the Bobcroft family then strides into the living room. My brother, Teddy, sits on the big chair in the corner because he's the littlest. I sit on the beanbag, which one day when we finally get a dog, I will give to him or her with great pleasure because I love dogs and I want a dog. And mum and dad sit on the sofa and make all those sounds like, ah, that grown-ups make when they sit down and they want to tell you that they're totally relaxing. Dad picks up a remote and holds it in the air like he's about to start a race to signal that film night is beginning. And like lightning, I pop on mum's noise cancelling headphones and I get my phone out. And Teddy, well, he gets his tablet out. And mum and dad press play. And we all sit quietly and watch our separate films. Mum and dad watch their film on the big TV. Usually it's a film where people follow each other around an old house saying long words at each other. And sometimes mum and dad suddenly randomly skip bits. And I'm not sure why. I guess they're impatient. 
I'll usually choose something exciting but age appropriate and on Sunday it was Dumbo which I was greatly enjoying though I have to say it was a little far-fetched. So just like every other Sunday we're all sitting there doing our separate things like a family when suddenly it happens. The music stops and the elephant disappears and now I can hear dad again and he's saying wovel love 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 so I take off mum's headphones and now I can actually hear him properly and he's complaining that their films just stopped. He's sitting on the edge of the sofa and he keeps pressing the buttons on his remote control but it doesn't help so he presses them again but much harder as if that's going to do anything. Well, I looked at mum and told her my film had gone too and she asked Teddy if his thing was still working but it wasn't. So we all just sat there for a bit and then we just put down our screens I went to bed. Now, I know that wasn't the most dramatic opening of all time, but you just wait because this is where things get weird. When I wake up the next morning, all I could hear was panic from downstairs. I checked my alarm clock, but it was dead. And even though I'd left my phone on charge just in case it came back to life in the night like a mobile zombie, well, that was dead too. I could hear Dad in the kitchen complaining about sleeping in and being late for work. He kept shouting... Alexa, what time is it? And Alexa, what's going on? And Alexa, what did I do? Why aren't you talking to me? I should just apologise if any Alexas have just gone off in any of your homes. Mum was muttering something about how the systems must have gone down, but apart from her and Dad, I couldn't hear any of the other sounds I normally hear. I couldn't hear Good Morning Britain or Sky News on way too loud. And Mum wasn't making her poached eggs in the microwave. There were zero beep beeps. Dad hates being late. He says when he was a kid, you could never be late, because in those days you couldn't text people to let them know you were going to be late, but that you were on your way. He says if you were late, when you got there, everybody would have just gone somewhere else because you were late. And you had no idea where, and you couldn't call them, so you just had to walk around for ages and hope you found them. What kind of system is that? It is madness. Someone should have invented phones a lot earlier, though Dad says they had one in each house. Poor Dad growing up like that. When you wanted to speak to someone, you had to phone their home phone and speak to a grown-up first. I mean, excuse me, but what? You had to talk to someone's mum and ask if you could speak to your friend. I'm sorry, but I have human rights. I don't need to get stuck answering boring adult questions about how mum's getting on or how school is. Time is money. Anyway, because of all the shouting, I go downstairs and immediately I can tell that something's not right, right? First up, what was that noise? Answer, that noise was nothing. There were no text message dings. There were no email whooshes. There were no bleeps or blips or tweety whistles or WhatsApp ting tings. Teddy was sitting miserably at the kitchen table with his blank tablet. Usually he'd be watching an age-appropriate video of giant airliners or something. And Dad's just staring at his phone and shaking his head. Anyway, just then there was a knock at the door and it was Sandra from next door. She says, have we heard? And we're like, heard what? And she says, oh, you haven't heard then? And we're like, heard what? And she says, well, it's not good news. And we're like, just tell us what we have or haven't heard. Anyway, she says her telly broke last night. And we're like, yeah, ours too. And then dad spotted Sandra was wearing a normal old fashioned watch and asked her what time it was because nothing in the house was telling him anymore. She said it was half past eight. And now Dad was double stressed because he knew he had an appointment somewhere at 9am, but he didn't know what it was or who it was with because he keeps his work diary on his phone. So he walked out of the house, shaking his head, and he got in this car. And then he got out of his car again because he'd forgotten his phone. And then he got back in the car again because it wasn't like he needed it. It wasn't working. And then he got back out again because, well, he should probably take it just in case. So that is some of chapter one of the day the screens went blank and here's the thing um they then realized something right and something quite important because i was mentioning there that you couldn't text people when i was a kid and you couldn't kind of uh, phone them um and you had to store every single phone number you would ever need in your head in your noggin which is ridiculous <laughs> who's got the brain space for that how, how did we ever do it but you just did you just you knew that your friend's number was three one blah 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 you knew your own number you knew other you just did nowadays of course we don't because it's all in our phone and we go to g for grandma and it dials grandma who knows grandma's number literally nobody not even grandma 
So when they realize their own grandma is now stuck somewhere because they slowly realize it's not just in their village, it's not just in their county, it's not just the country, but all over the world, the screens have gone blank. So how do they get in touch with grandma? They can't Skype her, they can't call her, they can't email her, they can't text her. They're going to have to get in a car and drive there. But like me, I was useless driving a car before GPS, you know, the maps and stuff that come in. That was brilliant for me because until then, if I wanted to drive anywhere, I would sort of drive down the street and then just go around the roundabout 50 or 60 times and then crash into a tree. <laughs> so when I suddenly had the maps telling me what to do, I could do it. But they've got to do it without without the, the maps. They've got to find the map. Used to have these big, ridiculous yellow books, a map of the whole country. They were ridiculous. And I didn't understand what was going on. Everything was A road this and B road that. And you'd drive somewhere and then you'd see a sign saying the junction 93 of the B582 isn't working. I hadn't memorized them all. You know, I, 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 how am I supposed to know? So I just wouldn't go anywhere. <laughs> that was, that was my <laughs> solution. Um, but they have to. So they've got to get across the country. In a world that's suddenly completely different because there are no screens. How do you pay for stuff? Um, how do you know how much petrol you've got if 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 it's a screen that tells you on your car? Um, you know the hospitals, the traffic lights, everything has gone crazy. But through, they start to realise that they can do this because people did for years beforehand before screens. Um, you know, drive somewhere um, and. Uh, and they find little moments of heroism and kindness on the way, and they find out things that they were scared of that maybe they shouldn't be scared of, and they work together. So, yeah, so that's what I hope. That's what I hope people get from it. And I hope it's a way to talk about lockdown as well, because for a lot of kids, I don't know how you feel. The last year has been obviously weird. We all know weird. I think for a lot of people, it's been quite sort of scary and confusing as well, and it's weird to talk about, you know especially when it's happened so soon into your lives. So, um, so, yeah, it's a way of talking about what happens when everything you knew. Great. And we're going to open up for questions in, in a second. But um, first, I have one more question, which is, um, obviously, you have you have kids who, um, your own kids, not, not someone else's. Who, no, 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 no. But, um, yeah, so what... what what did uh, what have your kids and, and your kids' friends thought of the book so far? They're, well, I mean, my kids are very polite. Um, <laughs> and even if they'd hated it, they would have gone, well done, Dad. You know, good try. Better luck next time. But they, they were super into it. Um, and, and I think because, you know, of the fact that we all... Um, use screens. I mean, I'm using one right now, and so is everyone else, um, in a way that we just wouldn't have thought of, uh, you know, a, a year and a bit ago. Um, I'd be in the bookshop in Tring right now with Ben, and he'd have made me a coffee, you know, but instead I've got to make my own coffee because I'm at home. It's disgraceful. Anyway, I'm someone who's, I, I see the benefits in, in screens, and I wanted to write a book that wasn't saying screens are bad. Um, I was, I wanted to write a book that said screens are important, and they're little gateways and magical portals. And my kids have been able to keep in touch with their friends from school all the time and keep their running jokes running. And it's been nice for me as a dad to listen to some of the conversations that I would not normally be allowed to hear or wouldn't be around to hear because it'd be happening at school or whatever. So yeah, I wanted to write a book that, that didn't say screens are bad, but instead said they're important. And what if they disappeared? Then we'd know exactly how important they are. <laughs> And we can see Ben, he's appeared again, he is. magically. He's not brought me a coffee though, has he? No, <laughs> no, I, I did make a, co a cup of tea. Oh, <laughs> for number how, one. How can I hand this through there? I'm, <laughs> yeah. I've, in my head, I've still, Email got, me. I, I've still got this image of, um, of you licking your bum like your cat. Oh, well, I was not expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> you described following your cat for the day. So yeah, I, I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be well, lovely for... questions, and guys, keep them coming in. But I think we've got about um, got about ten or twelve sitting there ready to be answered. Uh, I saw Archie written um, asked when Ar Archie's um, a wonderful little kid from Tring. Uh, what is the one screen you couldn't live without? Oh, wow! Well, that is a good. That's a very good question, Archie. 
Ooh, would it be the telly? I don't know. Maybe in the old days, you know, um, would it be would it be the computer? Well, the problem is then I'd have to do more work. <laughs> um, would it be my phone? Well, yes, yeah, sadly, like every other parent there, you know, um, I do rely on it a bit too much. You know, it's got everything. It's got everything right there, all, all in one handy screen. Archie, it's incredible. So it would probably have to be my my phone. Um, yeah, I guess so. I wish the. I mean, what else? What other screen could there be that would? I mean, um, I mean, I you know, no, but I can do everything on my phone. I'm trying to think of something unique that because phone is a very boring answer that I've just given you, Archie. It's a terrible answer. If I was you know doing well, I'd have come up with something more imaginative there. But the problem is that the, the phone does everything. I was going to say I can you know talk. I mean, you, you can see people on it. This isn't my phone, by the way. I've got one of those new invisible phones. Uh, <laughs> this is the one that I can't do without. I crushed it. Fantastic. Tracy wants you to go all the way back to the start. And she says, um, when did you decide to become an author? Was there a, a, a point in time? Was it an idea or was it just, um, yeah, what were you up to at the time when, when, when you became one? Well, you want me to go all the way back to the start. I was born on a cloudless night. <laughs> 1976, Tuesday, if I recall, around 2 a.m. My mother, a woman to whom I've become very fond and close, <laughs> um, uh, and then skip to, um, I was, I've always liked, I, at school, I always liked school projects, right? And it could be about the most boring thing in the world. It could be, they could say to me, Daniel, we want you to do a school project all about um, the history of wood. And uh, I'd be like, well, that sounds very boring, but uh, it's my project, I'm gonna do it. And then I would create the greatest project you've ever seen about the history of wood. Oh, and I'd have all different types of wood in there. And I'd talk about trees and benches and the first clogs. And, um, and you wouldn't read it because it'd be very boring, but I'd be very proud of it because it was my thing. And that's that had kind of led me to books in a sense because a book is a project that's yours to kind of mold and control and put all the love you can into and it's only when you press send that that project becomes kind of other people's problems as well <laughs> and and more of a, a big team effort but I love that 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 working on my own thing and creating something. And I hope there's kids watching who, who feel the same about wanting to create something, um, whether it's as an illustrator or whether that's, uh, you know, as a writer or whatever it might be. The great thing about it is you can, because you're in charge, right? You just need a keyboard. And if you haven't got a keyboard, which seems unlikely given you're watching, uh, <laughs> um, uh, a pencil, you know, a pen, you can create stuff. And I do it by asking a big question. You know, what if this happened? What if that happened? Who would it affect? Where would it go? And it should be like loads of ideas going off in your head where you could suddenly put it all together and find your find your adventure. Brilliant. Great answer. Um, Emma asks, what books did you read when you were a child? Well, I read um, uh, the standard answer that legally we all have to say, which is Roald Dahl. Um, I liked The Twits because it was a, a couple of grown-ups being absolute nitwits to each other horrible and i read it again recently and it's a weird book because um not much happens and there's not much of a lesson they're just mean to each other but i loved it and um i think we we love those books as well where we see grown-ups behaving a bit like kids because we realize that just because you've got older doesn't mean you have grown up um but i also love the beano um and the beano comic with dennis the menace and nasha it's been going 80 years, you know, my dad read it and then I read it as a boy and now my son reads it. And it's, they're just great little stories that they put so much heart and soul into. And it taught me quite a bit about humour and about how a, like a little world should work um, and about attention to detail, hiding little extra things in, in each comic that, that you could read a second time. And I've tried to do that um, a bit with with my books but also what's great is Gemma is such a great illustrator that when it comes when, when she gets her hands on it and she uh, can you know do the drawings um, she can add her own jokes and her own humor to it so it becomes like just non-stop 
That's, yeah, brilliant. There it is. There's the book. And I, nice. I do love the foiling. Whose idea was that, Eve? Was that yours? No, I can't take credit. That was the very um, talented designers, along with Gemma Coral, the illustrator as well, who would yeah. have come up with those ideas. But Eve does use that foil on everything. That's what she's known for. <laughs> so if she's making a sandwich, they'll go, would you like some cling film? And she says, no, shiny foil, please. <laughs> so that's just, that's just what she does. That's, yes, it, it makes writing very, very long-winded, I suspect. <laughs> it does. <laughs> um, who else? Sam has asked, uh, how long... And I, I suspect there's a whole load of answers. Is how long does it take to write a book? Hmm. Well, it depends how long it is. Um, and it depends how many long words you use. Because um, if you use a really long word, that can take anything up to a day and a half. <laughs> um, so I tend to use shorter words because I get more done. Um, but I suppose with this book, I wrote quite quickly because I felt it was, it, it was like of the moment, meaning it was kind of about these days in a strange way. And so I wanted to get it out there quickly. And um, it probably took it probably took a few months, but the thing is that I, I was really enjoying writing it. So it didn't feel like a few months. They always say, if you can have a job that doesn't feel like a job, that feels like your hobby, then you'll never feel like you're working. Um, they put it better, but that's kind of, that's kind of, that's how I, how I feel when I'm on a, on a roll with a book like this, you know, the weeks fly by. Um, but what I normally, what I do do, a good way to start if you're thinking, um, was it Sam that asked that? Yes. Sam, if you're thinking, what I do is once I've got my idea that excites me, um, I think of like maybe a character or maybe a name, and then I just start writing like anything, anything, just, just to get some words down. And it could just be something about their socks. It could be, I decide that they've got a cat. So what's the cat called? What's the cat like? What's wrong with the cat maybe? Um, and then you start to find out, oh, maybe this character, maybe they're missing something, or maybe they're missing someone, or maybe they have to do something. And slowly, the words, which you don't ever have to show anyone, because it, maybe it won't go into the book, but it gives you a start, and it gives you an idea, and then you get to know the person you're writing about, so that when you go, right, chapter one, you already know the person that you're going to describe. And that's quite an important thing. Brilliant. Jo you've got Joanne thinking about the... Um... Why would you write something about the history of history of wood? <laughs> well, uh, Joanne, it's very important. You know, uh, I mentioned clogs earlier. There's not just clogs, um, you know, uh, chopsticks. I think that's a form of uh, balsa wood. Um, so you wouldn't know that unless I'd done my very important research into the history of wood, um, which uh, Simon and Schuster, they don't know this yet, but they're very proud to announce, my publishers, um, they will be publishing the first of my 300 volume. Um, history of wood collection <laughs> which will be sold exclusively um at uh, ben's bookshop in tring <laughs> made got... with uh, hardback wooden books as hardwood, well. hardwood hardback we're going to change the, our the title of our shop actually we're going to record our, our wood bookshop yes good yes <laughs> and, and it, that's the only books you'll be able to buy there and ben i'm sure will agree <laughs> jo joanne then does ask a, a a proper question. Um, what dare I say? No, the last one was proper as well. But is there going to be a new Hamish book? Well, I, there's going to be another book in um, beginning of next year or end of this, maybe beginning of next year, about someone else entirely um, who shares some stuff in common with with Hamish, but also uh, is also his, his own person. Um, so Hamish may fight another day. But I've got some other stories to tell first, and then we'll maybe return to Hamish when he's a little older. Florence asks, uh, who is your favourite? And this must be the most impossible question for an author to answer. Um, well, particularly Danny, anyway. Um, who is your favourite, Hamish or Stella? Oh, how dare you ask such a journalistic and incisive question designed to divide is this world not divided enough already without asking me to choose between my babies um they're very different and they live in slightly different worlds hamish um is my favorite who lives in a slightly magical world where everything can happen and stella's definitely my favorite who lives in our world where weird things can happen but it's much more sort of real so I couldn't possibly say, and also, how dare you? 
Exactly. Well, to be fair, there's another question John wrote. What is your favorite book that you have written? Ah, well, for kids, I would, I, and I'm not just saying this, but probably the day the screens went blank because um, it just kind of flowed. And um, it, it, it's quite simple in many ways. A big thing happens. A girl has to do something. And then she drives to try and do it. And it's what happens along the way. The people they meet. I enjoyed that because it can kind of go anywhere and you can just suddenly introduce a new character. You can go, there was a lady by the side of the road. <gasps> now, who's this? Because it could be anybody. And what do they think about what's happened and what's, how has it affected them? So it's a great way of kind of meeting new real people along the way and either helping them or being helped or not being helped at all. There's one scene where they suddenly realise they're not able to pay for their lunch in a restaurant. And um, the lady won't accept checks. And Stella's like, what, what exactly are checks? And mum's like, well, they're bits of paper where you promise to pay someone some money. She's like, that sounds like a ludicrous system. <laughs> and, you know, and they can't pay my card. They can't get any cash out, all this kind of stuff. And they have to make a run for it. And they are not natural born criminals, these people. And the car is a little bit broken. So they have to make a getaway at about four miles an hour while uh, the very angry woman uh, from the restaurant is just walking alongside them. So disasters along the way are always fun to write. I had a very um, sensible um, little boy came to the door and a, a few days ago and I was describing uh, the basis for this, the day the screens went black. And I looked at him, I said, can you imagine anything <laughs> worse in the world? And he said, well, my parents would be up there. <laughs> and uh, he said, but wouldn't, wouldn't all power stop? Wouldn't electricity would, because I'm sure everything, I mean, he, he in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fraction of a second, he completely rationalized the whole thing as to what would happen. And for a, for a, for a nine-year-old, I was thinking, blimey, he's, he's, he's going places. I love that because, um, yeah, you have, to be, you have to make sure that the logic of your story is watertight because kids can spot any of that stuff. And I love sensible kids as well, which is why I like Stella. But I remember once at an event, um, I was talking about what would happen if the world stopped and what you would do. And I asked all the kids and, and had all these answers back. And it was kind of, they would, incredible stuff, crazy stuff, you know, going to banks and taking all the money or going to the department store and playing all the toys or whatever and one kid um was uh, he, he just put his hand up and i said what would you do if the whole world stopped and he went i'd probably go to the fridge and get a pint of milk just to calm my nerves <laughs> oh bless you that was the best that was one of my favorite answers ever because of course <laughs> you would <laughs> that's fantastic uh, joanne has piped up and says no my name is milo he, he's the little lad's on his mum's account so don't exactly worry. it's milo we all knew it was milo, milo jo knew. joanne's always taking the credit for milo's ideas and my, milo has just just randomly said hey mission the world stoppers that must be his favorite book ah well i'm very <laughs> who's mine or his oh, well, no no that's his I oh, it's his oh good thanks milo i'm very pleased indeed um samuel came back what would you write what made you write books for children instead of adults? And I would add uh, that um, Danny's Tom Ditto has to go down as one of my favourite books. Certainly has such uh -huh. great memories of being on holiday. And I was just telling Dan, Danny before we started about that. But uh, what Bless made you, you turn so to nice. children's books? Um, Dan? Well, I always like seeing if I can do something. So um, I never think, oh, I'm not allowed to, I'm not allowed to write a novel or I'm not allowed to write a kid's book or I'm not allowed to do a radio show or I'm not allowed to make a documentary for TV. I, I sort of think, um, well, what would I do and, and how would I do it? Um, and then I try and do it. And with kid's book, I'd, I'd had, you know, my first kid or my, my wife was involved, um, but we had a child together, our first one. And um, I loved listening to him laughing. And I loved finding out what made him laugh. And the, even now at school, I was, you know, after school, I'll say, what made you laugh rather than what did you learn? Because I think that's so important to find out what your kid um, or your mates, uh, what, what makes them laugh. Um, and so I wanted to see if I could make my son laugh and his pals and, and maybe, you know, lots of other kids as well. And so I thought, well, I'll give it a go. So what would I do? And I thought back to when I was a kid and I thought of an idea that I'd had when I was a kid, when I was going on a school trip. And I suddenly thought all these people we were leaving town, a little town, and they're all strangers, you know, and weird buildings I hadn't seen before. 
And I thought, are they always there, those people? Or are they just there as kind of like props or set dressing? You know, what if they were robots? Or what if I turned away, would they all stop moving? Mm-hmm. And so I tried it and they didn't stop. I had very little effect on the world. But that was the basis of the idea for World Stoppers. Um, what if that were real? What if actually, yeah, the world did just stop one day, except for you? Why you? And what would you do? How would you solve it? So, um, so yeah, so I, I, I always like those things. And that's how I got into writing for kids. Charlotte, and this is Max. Max asks, um, if you or your kids play Minecraft. Mm-hmm. Minecraft, Roblox, that one. I always call it the wrong name. I always call it like never again, but it's called, oh, what is it called? Not uh, alone again, or um, it's the, you know, the one kids, your parents don't. Um, it's the one where everyone's sus. Yeah. You know, you, you in an engine room and then someone, uh, whatever it's called alone, never. I can't remember what it's called. Someone will know. I'm waiting for a common among us. Among us. That's Milo. Well done, Milo. And John. <laughs> Yeah, I was calling it Alone Again. No, it's Among Us. Among Us. It's a much better title. But also, um, you may not know, audience, that uh, Danny actually has quite a strong connection to, to games and video games. You, you've, your voice has been inside many a video game. In it fact, has. you've won some awards for it as well. I have. I started off writing for video games magazines um, at school work experience at school and so and then I, I just loved it I loved magazines and again it was like a project it was like putting something together every single month um, and trying to make it good and it was about games and um, and then and then somehow yeah I ended up being an actor in games um, and I was offered the chance and I just thought yeah why not so um, but some of them you won't be allowed to play because they you know they're you know not yet grown up ones but others Thomas was alone. That's a lovely puzzle game where I play a square um, and, and, and some other things as well, other shapes, but that's a good one to play. Archie asks a good question. We love the Hamish books in our house. Is Hamish based on a real person? Hamish is, is not really based on a real person, but some of his team, the PDF, kind of are. And with some of the characters in the Hamish world, I, I like coming up with the names, right? And I would come up with a name and then that would tell me what the character was like sometimes. So like Madame Couscous, I knew would be very kind of strange and eccentric little woman with a stick. Um, and Mr. Longblather, who's the teacher and just the words long, you sort of know he's gonna be quite tall. He's probably going to be quite boring because of the blather and the long and everything takes forever. And that was definitely based on an old teacher of mine. Um, But I cannot tell you for fear of being taken to the courts. Sam has come back. What video games did you voice for? I wonder whether Sam has played them. Well, I hope not, Sam, because they are the Assassin's Creed series. Oof. Um, And I've been in... I don't know how many of them. It's probably about seven or eight. Um, there's one called Volume, uh, where I play a computer. And there's one, and there's Thomas Was Alone, um, uh, which has been fun. But I, I know I shouldn't let my son play Assassin's Creed. But, you know, I turned off all the bad stuff, any of the, the sort of, the, you know, the weaponry that he shouldn't be uh, near. And because it's he was doing projects on the Vikings at school I pretended that this was part of his Viking studies so um, we would go and play the Viking game together and it was a great part of his education brilliant brilliant is it weird playing a game when you're the voice on it Um, do you play Assassin's Creed yourself um uh, yeah I do but it is weird when I when I pop up especially because um uh, over the years I've become quite heroic and dynamic and um I even use a weaponry and um, he didn't used to do that. He was, um, it was, uh, he, he was supposed to be a very different character. And then um, they offered me the, the thing and then they, they even based him on me. So every now and again, something will, someone, will, someone sent me a magazine and it's all about my character. Um, however, it's just like me on the cover 
and it comes with a free cover mounted model of the character, but it's just a tiny me. <laughs> so, so those are those are weird moments. And I was in Italy with my son, and one of the games is um, set in Italy. And I was telling him, I said, you know, I'm in this uh, game, and he sort of knew vaguely. And I said, all these buildings are like exactly as they are in the game. And then a man walked past and went, "Are you in Assassin's Creed?" And um, that was pretty cool. However, I looked like a man who just goes to Italy to talk loudly about Assassin's Creed in the hope that one day someone will recognize me. <laughs> um, so I looked a little sad. Archie thinks they should turn Hamish into a video game. I'm sure you know the right people. Well, it's a good idea, Archie. Yeah, you start, you start, you, you come up with a, um, a, what we call a pitch, you know, do a front cover for it, t say what would happen in the game. I'll get it to the right people. I'm conscious that we've uh, we've run over time. Actually, I I, I do hope um, it's fine <laughs> by me as long as yeah. I do hope that's okay with you. Just uh, should we start there with a, a couple of extra questions? And then sure, we'll, we'll call it a day. Um, so Milo, why did you give your characters such silly names? How dare you, Milo? <laughs> and how you know Joanne? You know named you, and fair enough, she gave you a good name. Um, why did I name them such silly characters? And names? I know I've got a bit of a soft spot for silly names. I mean, you know, Hamish is a good Scottish name, which um, I put in there because uh, I was born and bred in Scotland and then lost my accent when I moved to England because no one could understand a word I was saying. It was very strong, very strong. Um, and the other ones like Long Bladder, I wanted, I wanted to be able to sort of... Um, tell you a bit about the character without them even having to open their mouths um and stella she's got a normal name except for her surname which is bobcroft because i just like i like the sound of words there's some words that are funnier than others and that changes i'll tell you that weirdly it changes over the years some sounds rhythm of words um right now like kettering is quite a funny word but maybe 10 years ago it wouldn't have been as funny and maybe in 10 years' time, Kettering won't be funny. But right now, Kettering's funny. I can't explain why. Um, but these things, there's some numbers that are funnier than others. Um, so you have to, yeah, I, I enjoy choosing just the right thing. And, and very often it's about rhythm, and it's the same with names. Yes, yeah. I think Milo's particularly taken by the name Madame Couscous. <laughs> yeah, Madame Couscous, you know. Um, yeah, it's a strange one, isn't it? I, thought, I just thought Couscous went with Madame. Even though, you know, Madame is probably French. Couscous sounds a bit French, but it's probably Moroccan. I don't know. Very international woman. Yes, very good. Right, one more. So I'm just going to give the book a little plug. I know um, uh, many of you have already got, already got the book, but if you want any more, want to give them as a gift to anyone, uh, you can get them as, um, for one day only, I'm doing it for a little bit off, uh, and they're signed as well. Ooh, I've even got a sign Ta-da! Ta there it is. That's, I, that's an official signature. You'll all get signed on anyway, so that's all good. Um, so Emma, let's let's finish with Emma's question. Um, what gave you the idea to make this book? So what was the was there a sort of moment, a blink in time? Was there a sort of uh, a eureka moment? Or? It was probably it was probably at the kitchen table, looking around and realizing that everyone was on a screen and. I was drinking a cup of tea and just looking around. And then I got my screen out. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> this is ridiculous. What are we doing? And everyone's sort of talking to someone. Someone's sending a message over here. Someone else is playing a game. Someone else is replying to something. So there was still communication going on. It wasn't like antisocial. It was quite social. It's just that we weren't being social together. Mm. So I think moments like that probably seeped into my head and made me realize... What if we got rid of them all, you know, just for a day, maybe. Um, but even that is too horrific an idea for some of the people watching right now. So poor Stella in this book. I mean, you know, do they come back? You know, why did it happen? I'm not telling you here. Um, and I might not even tell you in the book. You have to find out. No, no. I, I had, I've had those moments when you're in a tube carriage. And you look around and every single person, not that many children know what a tube carrot is, but um, you said, just staring at everyone on the tube, just staring at their phones, nobody conversing. Not that people converse on London tubes, really. It's a, I know. 
Well, in the old days, when you're waiting for a friend, you couldn't look at your phone or anything. You had to, but you had to look busy, right? It was, oh, you couldn't, you couldn't just be sitting there. So you'd get a packet of peanuts or crisps and you would just read the ingredients until your friend arrived. And that's how we lived for many years. Brilliant. Appalling. Brilliant. So I'm, I'm just going to, uh, a couple of little, of my questions, if that's right. So this last year, um, what else have you been doing other than um, children's books? Well, um, I've, I've, I've written the one for next year. Um, I have um, been doing a radio show every Sunday from here, from this exact chair where I sit. And it's all very clever. Again, without screens, I wouldn't be able to do that. But no one even seems to know that I'm at home. It's great. Um, that I've been doing a lot of writing for another sort of big project that I've, I've got coming up. Um, so I've been writing hundreds of thousands of words for that and lots of little plans. Um, and I've written a script. So I've been, I've, been, I've been keeping busy, but I've also been quite enjoying going outside and looking at trees slowly change and all the little moments that you normally miss um, and baking terrible banana bread. <laughs> I've poisoned nine people. Not just nine. So far. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm not the greatest chef, but, um, you know, but yeah, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a strange year for everybody. Um, but um, we've got through it and we're nearly there. So good luck, everyone. We are indeed. We are indeed. So a quick thank you, Eve. Thank you very much. Um, Eve, Eve is a good friend of Leanne who works in our bookshop. I don't know if any of you know Leanne. So um, uh, that's connecting. Eve and Leanne used to work together. Danny, thank you so much. I've, I've been a huge fan of yours for years. So this is a little bit of a, a oh. hero moment here. I oh, bless you. Thank you so much. It's very nice of you. I'm really pleased that you liked, um, yeah, the the novel as well, the Tom Ditto novel. It means it means a lot. Thank you. Yeah. But, uh, so, guys, thank you very much. This is the book. You can get it from us. Um, there's a link on the chat function. Grab that now whilst you can. And um, without further ado, thank you, Danny. You've been uh, you've been a, a hero. Thanks to all the kids as well. Thanks to uh, Milo. Um, uh, you know, watch out for Joanne. Never trust her fully. Um, uh, Sam and um, Joanne. Uh, no, who was the... Uh, uh, They've all been answered questions. All of you. Then. All of you. Archie. It was Archie. There was Tracy. Tracy. Was, um, uh, Nick, that's Florence. Thanks, Florence. Um, Max and Thanks, Max. and John. Charlotte and John. Uh, yes, loads, loads of them. And, Thank you uh, all. And if um, next time you've got a, 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 um, a children's book out, what we'll do is we'll do a um, event for schools, if that's all right. So we'll have um, uh, hundreds of schools. And that, that's always quite good fun. We do. Cool. Yeah, do maybe, we'll do, maybe we'll do the history of wood. And then we'll do the history of wood. Fantastic. Right. Thanks ever so much. Thank you both. And um, have a great day. See ya, Oliver and James. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks.